How's it going, everybody? My name is Josh, Amateur Radio Call Sign KI6NAZ. We are continuing through the Technician Class License Pool. We're journeying into Sub Element 7 Practical Circuits as we continue. If you have not already, there is a link in the description to a playlist that's going to walk through all the sub elements for your Technician Class License. Uh, feel free to subscribe or bookmark that playlist and go to hamstudy.org, start taking practice tests, and as you take the practice test, it's going to tell you which sub-elements you're having a harder time at. I recommend you focus on those sub-elements, watching the videos or reading books like Gordon West books, which are linked in the description below. Without further ado though, let's start this rolling. Sub-element seven is broken into four sections. So we're gonna start with alpha, the first section. Question one, which term describes the ability of a receiver to detect the presence of a signal? And that is B, sensitivity. You hear this a lot when you're, you know, radio companies are talking about their radios in regards to its level of sensitivity. Alpha zero two, what is a transceiver? And that is A, a device that combines a receiver and a transmitter. That makes sense, a transceiver. Most ham radios do both receiving and transmitting, and they're literally turning off the receiver to transmit back and forth. Once upon a time, back before it was all in a unit like that, you used to buy a receiver and have a separate transmitter. And they actually had a line that you would connect into the receiver that would deafen it before transmitting so you don't blow it up. Kind of important. Alpha zero three, which of the following is used to convert a signal from one frequency to another frequency? And that component is a mixer. Alpha zero four, which term describes the ability of a receiver to discriminate between multiple signals? And that is selectivity. You will hear selectivity come up um, oftentimes on the shortwave listening hobby where we look for receivers that have high selectivity, that are really, really good at discriminating um, signals that are not a part of that primary frequency. Oftentimes, as you start paying more money for better ham radios, a lot of what you're getting is the ability to be selective about the received signals. Alpha zero five, what is the name of a circuit that generates a signal at a specific frequency? So it could be just a sine wave, but that is D, an oscillator. They're used in many, many things, including things outside of amateur radio. Alpha zero six, what device converts the RF input and output of a transceiver to another band? And that is C, a transverter. These come up a lot in uh, when people want to go into like microwave frequencies for amateur radio. We'll take something like a two meter or 70 centimeter ham radio, hook another box to it that's a transverter box, and that box will step up that frequency from two meters or 70 centimeters into gigahertz or wherever we want it to be. Alpha zero seven, what is the function of a transceiver's PTT input? And that is B, it switches the transceiver from receive to transmit when grounded. Literally that button on the side of your microphone or your handheld radio's PTT button is telling the radio to switch from receive to transmit. Alpha zero eight, which of the following describes combining speech with an RF carrier signal? And that is C, modulation. Alpha zero nine, what is the function of the single sideband or abbreviation SSB slash CWFM switch on a VHF power amplifier. So like a toggle switch. And is B to set the amplifier for proper operation in the selected mode. They single sideband and then FM and CW perform differently in how they are used and how you're uh, gonna transmit into that amplifier for amplification. So that is what that does. Alpha 10, what device increases the transmitted output power from a transceiver? And it is a B RF power amplifier. Sure. Alpha 11, where is an RF preamplifier installed? And that is A between the antenna and the receiver. 
So those can be discrete boxes. Uh, there is usually a pre-amplification stage in your receiver as well. I have an antenna that has a preamp built into the line somewhere, and that gives a bit of amplification onto the receive signal that you then pick up on the radio. So that was the alpha section. Moving right into the Bravo section. This is a little bit on troubleshooting and dealing with issues that you may experience. Bravo Zero One. What can you do if you're told your FM handheld or mobile transceiver is over deviating? It is D, talk further away from the microphone. Yeah, that's like clipping or you're creating a um, distortion in your audio signal that you're transmitting. Oftentimes the easiest fix for that is to take the mic away from your mouth, or if you can, if the radio has this capability, dial back the mic gain some if you don't really want to uh, take your mouth away. Bravo Zero Two, what would cause a broadcast AM or FM radio to receive an amateur radio transmission unintentionally? That would be A, the receiver is unable to reject strong signals outside the AM or FM band. So this is a selectivity issue, which we talked about earlier in section A. Some cheaper radios, particularly non-super heterodyne radios or heterodyne family-based radios, are going to be more susceptible to this type of uh, un in, unintended reception of signals. That's often a sign of it being a cheaper radio, so keep that in mind as well. It's not necessarily the amateur's fault that another station is hearing the amateur radio station and not the broadcast station, for instance. Bravo 03, which of the following can cause radio frequency interference? And it is D. All of these choices are correct. A, it could be a fundamental overload, just a strong signal. B, harmonics, or C, spurious emissions. Harmonics and spurious emissions are a byproduct of transmitting, oftentimes the sign of a poorly filtered transmitting radio. When we talk about Baofengs um, having issues with harmonics and maybe sometimes spurious emissions, that's what we mean, is it can create interference on other adjacent frequency spaces or bands. Bravo 04, which of the following could you use to cure distorted audio caused by RF current on the shield of the microphone cable? And the answer to this is D, a ferrite choke. A ferrite is a mixture of some type of a metallic uh, and epoxy or some kind of blend that allows it to create like a donut, right? A metallic donut. Or like a noodle that's bisected, right? And that's cut down the middle. And then they're usually in a plastic form that clamps onto the cable in question, in this case, a microphone cable, like an XLR cable. What that ferrite does is create a high impedance field that will kick off stray RF that gets onto the shield of the mic cable or just a random uh, common mode currents that are picked up in the environment. This is often good if you want to like eliminate a hum that you might pick up on a mic cable or something along those lines. Bravo 05, how can fundamental overload of a non-amateur radio or TV receiver by an amateur signal be reduced or eliminated? So this is helping to suppress someone with a non-amateur radio or a television. A block the amateur signal with a filter at the antenna input of the affected receiver. This could be a bandpass filter or something along those lines that only would allow that particular broadcast frequency space to get through uh, and then null out the amateur frequencies that are adjacent to whatever um, is in that, that residential area or whatnot. Bravo 06, which of the following actions should you take if a neighbor tells you that your station's transmissions are interfering with their radio or TV reception? And that is A, make sure that your station is functioning properly and that it does not cause interference to your own radio or television when it is turned to the same channel. So this mentions radio and television. I already mentioned television. We, we've kind of got around all that by going to digital signals but 
the the best research that you can do and this is going into the weeds a little bit sometimes people will see your ham radio antenna uh, maybe you have a big antenna like i do on the roof and they'll start to come up with reasons why their devices aren't working and, and want to blame it on you uh, you're not necessarily obligated to fix their problems for them and the best thing you can do to prepare for any issues is to test your equipment against your radio or television in this rare instance where that's a thing to make sure that you don't interfere with yourself and if you're not interfering with yourself then the odds are pretty low that you're interfering with them bravo 7 which of the following can reduce overload of a vhf transceiver by a nearby commercial fm station and it is D, installing a band reject filter. And these are available online, or you can look up plans to create your own, but it basically creates a null point. It filters out, for, for example, the FM broadcast frequencies, for instance. And in my case, I have a really, really strong AM radio station less than three miles away as the crow flies. And so I have installed a AM broadcast filter on my amateur radio station to prevent that type of overloading. Bravo 08, what should you do if something in a neighbor's home is causing harmful interference to your amateur radio station? This is D, all of these choices are correct. And let's walk through these. A, work with your neighbor to identify the offending device. Uh, what they have not mentioned here is that sometimes just brokering that discussion can be uh, a little uncomfortable. So let's continue reading. B, politely inform your neighbor that FCC rules prohibit the use of devices that cause interference. And C, make sure your station meets the standards of good amateur radio practice. I've talked about this in other videos in much longer form discussion because this is a real problem. We live in a world now where I don't want to say cheap Chinese electronics, but but I will, um, do get released into the United States with poor compliance to FCC guidelines. And this can yield a situation where something as simple as a power inverter, a charging cable for some of these devices, is actually transmitting these spurious emissions that causes interference on your station. I experience it. I'm sure you've experienced it. Pretty much every ham in their entire lifetime will experience it at some point. The difficulty here is not that there is a requirement to have FCC compliant devices. Okay, sure. You can say that until the cows come home to your neighbor and they're not going to care. The best thing you can do is try your best to build some kind of a rapport with your neighbor have some kind of relationship where you can bring up things like this and then earnestly and honestly try to help them um, to help you in solving the problem. Oftentimes, this is best done by explaining why they're having devices like these could be having issues to their own electronics. It just so happens that you're a prime candidate to find the issues because you're a radio operator and an enthusiast. And so explaining to them, well, that, hey, you're also interfering with your own electronics most likely and if i help you out here it might improve some of the other issues you may be having around your home that is a true statement it will depend of course what the um, offending device is but it will often help them out too it's not just going to help you bravo 09 what should be the first step to resolve non-fiber optic cable tv interference caused by an amateur radio transmission um, get on HDTV. <laughs> D. No, the answer is D. Be sure all TV feed line coaxial connectors are installed properly. Yeah, sure. Because if they're loose, uh, once upon a time, you know, the, I don't want to say arcing, but that where, you know, the, the connector's not like on there all the way, uh, you would sometimes, that would pick up amateur radio signals, which is kind of wild. Again, we, we've kind of uh, gone away from this. Analog television is kind of a thing of the past, but we still should probably understand it. Bravo 10. What might be a problem if you receive a report that your audio signal through an FM repeater is distorted or unintelligible? And D, all of these choices are correct. Your transmitter is slightly off frequency. Okay. B, your batteries are running low. Probably also true. You start to transmit less power if that's the case. 
C, you are in a bad location. This one is more often true than not. Location is everything, particularly for line of sight radios. So if you can't hit a repeater in your home like you normally could, get up, move around the home, potentially even go outside, and that can solve the problem pretty quickly. Bravo 11, what is a symptom of RF feedback in a transmitter or transceiver? So meaning your own RF is feeding back into your radio. It is C, reports of garbled, distorted, or unintelligible voice transmissions. So what's happening there is your mic cable um, is picking up RF, which is getting into the microphone sensor, and then getting into your radio. So it's almost this weird kind of RFE feedback loop type of thing. You want to avoid that wherever possible. All right, so that was section B. We're moving into section C. This is a good section. So this is Charlie 01 of subsection seven. What is the primary purpose of a dummy load? If you ever heard of that before, dummy load. A, to prevent transmitting signals over the air when making tests. Uh, yeah, it's like a fake antenna. You can crank up your radio to full power, or at least the full power that the dummy load can accept. And you can use that for testing your transceiver. We often also deploy a dummy load when we start doing amplified amateur radio using an amp. And we'll use the dummy load to tune up the 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 amplifier with a tube-based amplifier before we go into then through the antenna and out the air. So dummy loads, very important for your shack. Many of you likely will uh, end up having one if you get into HF amateur radio. Charlie 02, which of the following is used to determine if an antenna is resonant at the desired operating frequency? And we use B, an antenna analyzer. This is one of the most important pieces of kit, a tool that you can add to your amateur radio arsenal when you get into HF amateur radio. They are invaluable and they're very useful. So go check out some of my other videos like on the Nano VNA and the Rig Expert devices. Very, very good. So there's that one. Charlie03, what does a dummy load consist of? And it is B a non-inductive resistor mounted on a heatsink. So yeah, either a big resistor or a whole bunch of resistors on a heatsink. There are even dummy loads that are in a can, like a paint can, and full of oil. And that acts as a heat dissipant. Is dissipant a word? I don't know. Charlie04. What reading on an SWR meter indicates a perfect impedance match between the antenna and the feed line? And if you're watching some of the previous videos, that is C, one to one, which is represented as one, the colon character, and another one. But we call it one to one. Charlie zero five, why do most solid state transmitters reduce output power as SWR increases beyond a certain level? And that is A, to protect the output amplifier transistors. We call them the finals often, and sometimes you may hear someone say, oh, the finals are blown on this radio. Once I fix it, I'll get it back on the air. We have something called fold back or a fold back circuit in newer radios, this being one of them, that as the SWR creeps up, generally north of three to one SWR, power output will go down. And that is to protect the finals so we hopefully don't blow the finals. Charlie 06, what does an SWR reading of four to one, and SWR is an acronym for standing wave ratio. What does that indicate? It indicates D, that you have an impedance mismatch, meaning your antenna, the ohms that are seen at the radio on that frequency when transmitting, are not lining up, and that could be problematic for your transmitter. Charlie 07, what happens to power lost in a feed line? Where does it go? How did we lose it? You know, what's the concept here? Well, if it's not going out the antenna, it's gotta go somewhere, and it's still radiated energy that your radio is putting out. So you lose it in a very specific way, and, and how do you lose it? C, it's converted to 
heat. So good coax, we're calling that the feed line in this case. Coax is most often the feed line that you're using. If you have junky feed line, junky coax, you'll actually get it heating up in spots in the weak spots that it has uh, in the line. So keep that in mind. Good coax, always a good idea. Charlie 08, which instrument can be used to determine SWR. Again, standing wave ratio is the acronym here. And it is D, a directional watt meter can be used. We can also use an antenna analyzer for this job as well, but the answer in this one is directional watt meter. Charlie09, which of the following causes failure of coaxial cables? And it is A, moisture contamination. This is one of the most important things to remember for feed line, for coax, is weather protection. Particularly if you live in moister climates than I do, the connector on coaxial cable is not a waterproof connector. So you need to go in and put the appropriate weatherproofing on that coax to protect it because, and unfortunately, it will let water in. And there is a dielectric insulator that is in between the center pin of your coax and the shield that wraps around the outside, that will accept water. Once that starts happening, your coax cable pretty much becomes useless and you either have to retire it completely or take it off and let it dry out, which can take an exorbitant amount of time. Because if you think about it, there's only two ends of the thing and if it gets all the way in, how long is it gonna take to get all that water out? Almost forever? Um, it could be impossible in some cases. Charlie 10. Why should the outer jacket of coaxial cable be resistant to ultraviolet light? D. Ultraviolet light can damage the jacket and allow water to enter the cable. It always comes back down to weather resistance and the resistance to it let water in. You want to use coax that is that will prevent degradation of UV light. Uh, eventually, over time, coax gets bad and has to be replaced, but you should do what you can to prevent that. And a good UV-resistant coax is one of the ways to go. All right, last question in section Charlie. Charlie 11. What is a disadvantage of air core coaxial cable when compared to foam or solid dielectric types? C. It requires special techniques to prevent moisture in the cable. It all comes down to moisture. So uh, I don't have air core coax. That's usually some expensive uh, stuff that you know some people have. I don't. Uh, but yeah, the, that, that has its own headaches, I assume. All right, moving on to section D, the last one. This is Delta 01. Which instrument would you use to measure the electric potential? A, a voltmeter. Delta zero two. How is a voltmeter connected to a component to measure applied voltage? And it is in parallel. That's how you would uh, line it up to measure the applied voltage. Delta zero three. When configured to measure current, how is a multimeter connected to a component? It's in series. A. So flipping that on its head a little bit to measure the current. D zero four. Which instrument is used to measure electric current, and that is an ammeter. D06, which of the following can damage a multimeter? And it is C, attempting to measure voltage when using the resistance setting. Um, yes, also, if you just take the voltage too high beyond what the multimeter is actually spec'd for, you can um, release the magic smoke that way too. Delta 07, which of the following measurements are made using a multimeter? Voltage and resistance, that's what we use them for. Delta 08, which of the following types of solder should not be used for radio and electronic applications? The answer is A, acid core solder. None of that, never ever uh, bring that into your ham radio shack. Delta 09, what is the character characteristic appearance of a cold tin lead solder joint? And it is a rough, or lumpy surface. Sometimes a cold joint will also look like just a uh, like a water, like a ball that you just 
dropped on top of the on top of the pad or on top of the lead uh, that is an indicator that you it, it didn't reach the appropriate temperature to flow fully delta 10 what reading indicates that an ohm meter is connected across a large discharged capacitor a increasing resistance with time well, again like an oven what do capacitors do they slowly heat up or reach the volume of power that they can hang on to and then when it's removed they slowly lose it kind of like heat in an oven not the same concept but it's kind of a good mnemonic device all right well that is sub element seven we're quickly coming to the home stretch about to complete the technician question pool reminder as always go to hamstudy.org start taking those practice tests and it'll tell you pretty quickly which sub elements you have issues with then go to that video that I make uh, on the playlist that I'm linking in the description and you should be able to quickly come up to speed and hopefully get to the point that you are able to pass your technician license test. Thank you very much for watching these. If you do find them helpful, drop me a comment below. Consider subscribing. I'm linking you to the next video in the sub element series and always the links are in the description for everything else I recommend on studying. I'm Josh KI6NAZ. I'll talk to you later. 73.